Hello, hello. Good morning. Abari zasbui. Ninzuri. Masuze mutia basebo neva nyabo. balava. You're most welcome to this morning session. I'd like uh, people at the registration desk to please um, come in and we get started. Our keynote speaker is already set and I'll be inviting the chair of the next session soon. People at the registration desk, please, would like to have you here. I will not mention any name. Kindly, let's get here. Let's get in. In the meantime, I'd like to ask our friends seated at the far end, please get to the middle column. Kindly, let's move to the middle column. We have our online audience. I hope the online audience is able to connect with us at this LIAR 3 conference. Um, yesterday, we had a virtual presentation that did not go well, but we have planned that today it will be hosted in the afternoon. So the session on um, uh, discourse analysis and um, Forensic Linguistics will be held later this afternoon from about 2.40 to the end of the day in 5.1. 5, 5 in 5.1. Lecture room 5.1. So what do you do? You get onto the session, those on the virtual platform get onto the session and then our technicians will direct you or will transfer you to the virtual venue for your presentation. Later this evening, we have the Choose Cultural Gala. The Choose Cultural Gala, sponsored by the principal and the dean principal of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and the Dean of the School of Languages, Literature and Communication, sounding the choose drum. We have very many cultural presentations. So do not miss your own cultural presentation and to dance to it. It will be at the Arts Quadrango, the Arts Quadrango, in the former Faculty of Arts. We will direct you in case you don't know where the Arts Quadrango is. Today we'd like to, go, to be good managers of time. So I'd like to implore the chairs that do not stick to the, to the rubric. If you, we said 15 minutes, so if we, can have an, if, if we can work with time and maybe reduce our presentations to 10, just in case, you know, we find that we don't have enough time, please, uh, it's at your discretion. But we want to try as much as possible to keep time because you prepared for this all year round. Um, I hope everyone is okay, is feeling at here, Karibu Tena. This is Liar 3 at Makere University. So at this moment in time, allow me to invite um, our chair. I'll start with the chair for the morning session, Professor Martin Maus. You're most welcome. 
and also invite the keynote speaker this morning, Professor Arena Bislak. You're most welcome. Okay, so we'll start off our morning with a word of prayer, at least, and I'd like to ask my senior colleague, Dr. Florence Baiga, to lead us in a word of prayer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to... Layer three, day two. Um, can we stand up for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today again to continue with the program of our conference. I pray that you send us your Holy Spirit to lead us through and to give us wisdom and understanding in everything that we are going to discuss. Bless those who are going to present and also bless those who are going to listen in and give feedback to their presentations. We pray in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Dr. Florence Baiga. Laya Oe. Laya Oe. Makere Oe. Ra. Ah. Over, over to you, Professor Martin Bowles. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to do this little task for Sauda and for Laia. Laia, oye! Makere, oye! Alena, oye! Yeah. Ra! To make the new chairman, chairwoman very happy. Ra. Uh, it's a, it's a great pleasure indeed uh, for me to do this. Uh, um, I'm, I must congratulate the organization to, uh, to invite Alena Witzlak Makarevich to give this uh, um, keynote speech. Um, personally, very happy because I'm a great admirer of her work. So I was very uh, pleased to see her. Uh, get more time to, to say what, um, to make us part of all her uh, research that she's doing. No, not all her research, because, I mean, you can read in the book about uh, Alena and that she's a senior lecturer at the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem, and her broad interest. Um, I, uh, you know, when, uh, when I see the author Alena Makarevich-Witzlak, uh, Witzlak Makarevich, then I think I have to read this article. Um, often you read articles because you think this is a topic that I'm interested in, uh, but that doesn't work very well because uh, uh, Alena ri writes on all sorts of things, but it's always interesting. I really admire that. It's, um, you know, when you want to make a career in, 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 in science, in academia, maybe a a smart way seems to be to publish on the same thing over and over again, and you'll become an expert. But there are some scholars who will follow their curiosity all the time. And, and what is, I think, so strong in Alena's work is that she follows that, and it can be on phonetics, can be on syntax, all sorts of topics. Um, and then to, to study those uh, topics of interest, she has a a wide scala of instruments. She can, she can look with a microscope or a telescope. She can, if, the, if the problem uh, really needs detailed analysis, that's what you get. If it needs 
a bird's eye view, that's what she'll do, and this is incredible. Um, I think in, uh, I, I consider myself to be a descriptive linguist, uh, but the other side of the coin is typology, uh, and I don't know how to combine these things, but Alena is yin and yang, is both, she does it both. So I'm uh, very curious to, uh, to, li to, to listen to you and to, to learn about the long title of uh, corpus building and using um, uh, for descriptive and documentation in, uh, with experiences from three languages across the continent. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, colleagues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this extremely flattering introduction. Thank you, uh, dear organizers, for giving me the chance, the honor to speak here. There are so many other wonderful uh, colleagues, um, so I feel very humbled to be given the opportunity to present my research. And with this, could we kindly switch to my slides? Thank you. So uh, what I thought of presenting today is to give you my, a bit of my personal journey uh, of uh, doing descriptive documentary research across a number of languages in, on the African continent and to share with you the insights, the take-home messages of uh, what I learned what, during this experience uh, and see how we can do it better. Get input from you, get advice from you. Okay, so um, I will really go from project to project, starting with project zero, and in between, I will talk about um, the role of language documentation, the role of spoken corpora in describing and documenting languages, endangered languages, um, and uh, we'll share advice and insights as we go. So um, as a young MA student, I accidentally ended up in this wonderful village you see at the top right corner in South Africa called Richtersfeld, and my task allocated by the project was to work on information structure in a uh, Khoikhoi language called Khoikhoi or Nama, Richtersfeld Nama in this area. And after three months of staying in this area, I uh, came back with a corpus of uh, 14 texts, a few uh, short stories, a dialogue or two, and 14 so-called pair stories. So elicited material with the help of a video film. Now, um, back then I already realized, wow, I have this text, and I, we, there was a previous description of the majority dialect for the language, and what I saw in those texts did not match what I read in the grammars. And this was quite a surprise. So the structures, the syntactic structures you encounter in spoken naturalistic language do not match, did not match previous descriptions based on elicitation methods. My other take home message was it's really hard to work on information structure with the tools available back then. I, there are people here who do a fantastic job by providing us with more tools. Yenike is among them. Uh, I hope the task got easier for those of you who dare to um, work on the topic. So um, what happened to me coincided with a large trend happening globally in the world, namely uh, what I call here the institutionalization, difficult word, I'll try again, institutionalization of language documentation. Essentially, um, the community of linguists realized that a lot of languages in the world are disappearing and we have to do something about it. Namely, we have to establish um, specific institutions, research institutions, program to document. We have to encourage students to go um, to their hometown and work on a language, write a dictionary, produce a corpus. And we have to produce teaching materials, develop tools for all this kind of research. And um, in 2000 and then 2002, several two major programs appeared. First, DOBES, Documentation of Endangered Languages by Volkswagen Foundation, which founded over 100 projects on minority languages globally. And then in 2002, ELDP. And I met quite a few people here who had funding via ELDP and participated in this program. So kind of riding this wave, we applied with colleagues from Germany for a project to document the language called NU, a uh, two language from South Africa. Now, Mu thought by linguists to be extinct, extinct. Until in the late 1990s, a speaker of this language made a radio announcement and um, revealed herself to the world looking for other speakers of this language. And what followed uh, has been described as an odyssey of rediscovery. 28 fluent speakers were discovered, in quotes, all over Southern Africa, or South Africa, Botswana, and um, 
with this, researchers could start to work, you, to, work to document this language. I'm very happy and uh, proud of the last by now remaining speaker, uh, Her Excellency Hu Katrina Esau, who received in 2023 in March an honorary doctorate from University of Cape Town as the uh, protector, as a sole single keeper of this language. Um, so uh, in 2007, we started a project called a text documentation of Mu. Um, PI was Tom Guldeman, who a lot of you know. Um, we benefited a lot from participating in ELDP training. We um, had a huge community of researchers worldwide who were using the same tools, and we benefited a lot from the exchange. We tried to automate a lot of tasks, so uh, doing our best, essentially. There were quite a few challenges. Uh, NU was, still is, exclusively an oral language. There were no fluent speakers under the age of 65, and there were no speakers literate in either this language um, well, in this language, they were all literate in Afrikaans. Um, there were limited possibilities to engage younger community members. They were just not around or not particularly interested in the um, promotion, documentation of the language. And there wasn't much interest from the local linguists. They all had their own projects on unrelated languages, were just busy with life. Um, and also, one thing I'm really not proud of, or ashamed of as a linguist, there was a competition between linguistic teams for work on this language. A lot of misunderstanding, what is the best orthography for the language? What should we focus on? And these were the insights which I kind of tried to compensate in my re later research. In any case, we did manage to collect a decent corpus for an exclusively oral language in this setting, so we got 100,000 words of spoken text. We transcribed quite a lot of them with a lot of effort, and we released a um, major part of them with glosses, with annotations via this um, program called Dorico. Um, you might ask, so why did we spend these three years collecting this corpus? And I would like to emphasize the role of corpus-based linguistic description to those of you who still doubt. So uh, one answer is that the task of descriptive linguists is to describe the individual languages as rigorously as possible with maximal accountability to naturalistic corpus of data, ideally collected with a broad uh, program of language documentation in mind to ensure that we cover the full spectrum of language structures um, of this specific language. I have another answer. Um, a lot of patterns of language choice and language internal variation related to regional variation, related to register, related to style, can only be systematically studied by examining corpora of spontaneous speech using dedicated computer software. So we uh, approach this task knowing that we need this corpora for a lot of descriptive work. What we used it for, we uh, wrote a number of research papers. We uh, contributed to a major lexicographic uh, work on the language. So in 2002, Bonnie Sands and colleague, us as co-edited, uh, contributed to the dictionary of Nuki, and uh, we made the corpus available for the use by other researchers. And I'm happy to see publications which use our corpus, which use this corpus, appearing, um, well, growing every single year. Right. So that's kind of, is optimistic, but I'm pretty sure we could have done it better. And the question is, how can we do it better? And I would like to share another experience which I think uh, was better. So um, I will talk about a language close to home, to here, Rulinunyara, an East Bantu language spoken in Uganda. So um, the language has got quite a few names, uh, Luduli, Luruli, Ruruli, and so on. These are two closely related varieties, and there are a number of dialects. The dot uh, circled with the red circle is where approximately the language is spoken. Um, there are up to 230,000 ethnic uh, Baruli and Banyala, but we can only estimate how many of them actually speak the language. We know that younger people um, speak it less frequently. The story we see all over the continent. Before we started the project, the language was essentially, uh, first it was unrecognized for a while. Um, it was in the past, for historical reasons, believed to be a dialect of Luganda, though actually it's not even from the same sub-branch as Luganda is, right? And it has been previously undescribed. So if you looked at Glottolog, the resource I promoted in the workshop here, um, a few years ago, you see the only mentioning is 
the introduction of the number to give this uh, language its own ISA code. And uh, some overview resources like uh, the languages of Uganda by Lade Forget, where it's mentioned that this language, and um, something called the Uganda Protectorate. So uh, what happened politically is that in 1997, um, two, uh, several new administrative districts were found, and um, two kings were en enthroned. And this political success motivated or encouraged the community to, um, well, to follow their interest in the promotion and revitalization of the language. Around the same uh, time, SIL showed up um, on the ground and started to develop uh, an orthography and work on the Bible translation. And that's kind of also gave us the opportunity to see how we can contribute to the documentation, revitalization, and development efforts. So when in 2016 a call was published by Volkswagen Foundation, um, Professor Sauda approached me and we thought, okay, that's a good opportunity to do something jointly. And we applied for a project with this very long title, essentially a comprehensive bilingual dictionary, talking rural English dictionary with um, a lot of words following. Right. <laughs> so, um, from my previous experiences, I wanted to do a better job, and um, I believe Sauda has her own experiences, so we all were, were very positive, we were very all enthusiastic of how we can do the best out of the resources we have. What we did uh, differently is we tried to engage as many interested people as possible. So our first trip uh, was a big team of researchers, Professor Namyala, two PhD students, and I hope they're here, Anatol and Amos are around, yes. Um, we had a German partner, me, back then, a German postdoc, two South African mentors, and uh, you might not see it, but uh, Dr. Rus Mukama, who used to work here, Professor Rus Mukama, uh, is one of our, was one of our mentors. So, um, one of the declared goals of this project was to uh, produce a corpus-based grammar sketch and a dictionary. And uh, before... Well, starting doing this kind of work, we really wanted to know, so what do other projects in the areas do? How they manage these uh, such tasks? Uh, we know that the corpora play um, or are playing an increasingly important role in today's lexicographic work in dictionary making uh, because they produce raw material for lexical entries. We get objective evidence about language in use, we get frequency data about individual forms, about individual usages, about individual senses. We get authentic examples. And I would like to cite a colleague who is not here, but I've seen him yesterday, the scriber. No serious compiler would undertake a large dictionary project nowadays without one corpus and preferably several. So with this idea in mind, we thought, okay, what can we do with the resources we have at hand? Um, one can ask, okay, so how much, how big a corpus does one need for a lexicographic study uh, or a dictionary? And the answer is obviously the more the better. Um, with small corpora, there are a lot of challenges um, due to the so-called Zipfian distribution. Essentially, language consists of a lot of, uh, of a small number of very commonly used words. So in a huge uh, British national corpus of 100 million of words, 45% of all the corpus are just the 100 most frequent words. So essentially, even if you have a large corpus, you still end up running into the same words such as the, or he, she, and, uh, but, and so on. So um, we knew that this challenge is there, and we wanted to see what other uh, researchers have done on other Bantu languages. And um, uh, I cite uh, Describer and Nabiri here. I'm not sure, is Nabiri uh, around? Oh, yeah, yeah. I cite you quite a bit. So, um, right. So, corpus building efforts for the Bantu languages remained in their infancy. The situation is comparable not only for Bantu, it's comparable for other um, groups of uh, languages in sub Saharan Africa. I can speak from the Koikwadi and Tu perspective, but please share with me your experience with Nilotic languages, with Saharan languages, and with languages in other areas. Now, on the other hand, we do see progress, and I would like to um, showcase or to mention a few success stories, I would say. There is, uh, for the Great Lake, Lakes Bantu languages, the corpus of Kirundi, um, which was built during three PhD theses at the University of Ghent. Um, almost three million with um, about half a million of oral texts of unknown origin. We have the corpus of Luganda, uh, compiled by Deo Cavalian. 
Santiago is around. Yeah. Right? Uh, with uh, a small oral component, which I believe is compiled of radio news, but I will be happy to hear clarifications. Now, this massive corpus building work on these languages was possible because these are the languages which have a, written, a huge, rich written tradition. So essentially, you just take whatever is there online or digitize um, um, texts which are around. Um, there are a few issues, I would say, with this uh, corpora. They are not, to my knowledge, freely accessible, and there might be copyright issues and whatnot, other issues. The majority of these corpora uh, and other corpora for the Great Lakes Bantu languages are in the so-called raw form. So essentially, it's just text without any part of speech marking, without any lemmatization, without any glossing, without translation. And uh, as I tried to indicate earlier, these corpora are heavily skewed towards written language. Oral language is underrepresented. I would like to highlight one notable exception. We have the corpus of Lusoga by Naberye, which is around three million, uh, sorry, which is, yeah, about three million, with a huge oral component of almost 80, uh, 800,000 words. Uh, part of it has been published in a book, and I've seen it yesterday. You can have a look. I think it's been uh, sold at the stall outside. Um, and I do like how uh, Naberia motivates her decision, uh, saying that for a language which to this date is chiefly an oral language, it is simply uh, looked like a necessity in order to make sure, to work on the corpus, spoken corpus, in order to make sure that the explanations drawn from the corpus would also reflect real language usage. So um, we had these examples in mind. We knew what's feasible in our case as unwritten language uh, with the resources we have. Uh, what we also wanted to emphasize in the work we did was the focus on audiovisual corpus of conversations. And you might ask, well, what's wrong with radio news, right? Or what's wrong with, I don't know, personal narratives or other types of texts? And um, our answer is that uh, we follow or believe into the paradigm which says that informal social interactions, so conversations, people talking, are the, you can say, primordial home of human language. I cite colleagues here. So um, when people talk, there is more than just words and sentences going on. We do encounter all sorts of other expressions of how interaction works. People sigh, people look at each other, people say, uh-huh, mm -hmm, eh, uh, yes, you're right, or uh, what do people say here? Uh, there are a few phrases which people use a lot in conversation. People suck teeth, that's a very frequent practice, right? To show disapproval on what not, right? So um, if you work on speeches, you're never going to get this type of facts. Um, so uh, we believe that conversational corpora, apart from being the way we speak most of the time, representing the way we speak of the, most of the time, uh, these corpora harbor insights about a lot of what's going on in real life use of the language. Turn taking, timing, when do I stop, when do you start as my, uh, my partner in the conversation, about sequence structure, and so on. Um, I would like to um, show this plot from a um, recent publication by Dingemanser and colleagues, which um, shows that out of those um, seven to 8,000 languages in the world, only 78 languages, according to them, have any kind of talk corpus or uh, talk resources of uh, real language used in conversations. And I'm very proud that the language Nu we worked on uh, is one of them. And Ruli is not on this map, but it's one of those 78 languages. So we see what's been done, not much. We see what's needed. And you might wonder, well, that's purely academic enterprise. Why do we care? But uh, authors of this paper believe, and we share their view, that there are a lot of future practical applications beyond grammar writing and dictionary writing for this conversational corpora. They call it empirical foundations for flexible, localizable, humane language technologies of the future. So for developing language technologies, you don't need only newspaper articles. You really need to have talk in real life. Okay. <clears throat> So we had these ideas in mind, and we jumped into our project on the documentation of Ruli Lunyara. When you apply for a project, you promise a lot. You produce these schemes of, I'm going to do this in the first month, and that in the first month, and that's what's going to follow, and that's when we're going to go to the first uh, field trip, and so on. So we had financial restraints. We had time restraints. People have to work. People have to teach. People have to go to the university to study. 
Essentially, we knew that we have three weeks of intense field work, and the question was, what can we do in these three weeks in the best possible way to work to compile this corpus? Um, what I would like to present is essentially a story of compromise. We thought, okay, millions of words would be fantastic, but it's a spoken language. We only have three weeks. Let's um, have 100,000 words as our target. Uh, we'll try to minimally segment it, split into intonation phrases. We do want to have translations and transcriptions for all of what we record. And we would like to use a format which is accessible to most uh, of the project members, so something simple like plain text, so that we can use regular softwares uh, for concordance searches and so on. We did have major limitations due to um, the digital literacy of the transcribers, uh, to the av availability of laptops, well, presence of electricity on this specific day, and so on. So we had this goal in mind, and by the time our field trip was over, we kind of managed to collect the double number of words we had in mind. So 200,000 words. Uh, we had over 40 hours of recordings. We recorded 102 speakers, and they're all listed in the, um, in the uh, dictionary. Uh, we visited 15 locations uh, and uh, had multiple recording sessions. The question is, how, do we do, how did we manage it? And I believe it's an Im impressive um, um, well, success. Um, but the question is also, what can we do better next time? So uh, we approached very systematically and said, OK, what do we need to do before the trip? What do we do during the field trip? And what do we leave for after? Uh, so we had this workflow in mind. D develop the workflow, part number one. Think through how we're going to do it. Get ready. Go to the field, record, process, segment, transcribe, and then do the rest afterwards. So uh, when we started, I spent quite a while looking at workflow descriptions by other colleagues, how other major documentation projects have done their work. And there are uh, quite a few informative um, guidebooks around. So we, I knew we have to think about, or we knew we have to think about, what are the individual tasks? Uh, what should come out as deliverables out of those tasks? What are the pitfalls? Who is responsible? Which skills do we need? Can we learn those skills before we go? And so on. I had a very complicated scheme drawn, and my colleagues stopped me at the right time saying, no, no, too much, <laughs> just slow down. Let's do it um, slower. Um, so uh, what we ended up, we starting by having two workshops with the project members um, and a retreat, and you might see and recognize Amos in the first picture at the bottom, we talked about data types. We talked about file types. Um, so we had, like, we covered the basis of IT literacy. We talked about file naming conventions. We talked about which kind of metadata we need and how are we going to collect and store them. We played with the equipment. We spent hours turning on the recorder, turning off the recorder. We uh, looked at storage options. Which, do we use a hard drive? Do we try to upload our recording so that nothing is lost? We um, prepared consent forms. Every speaker had to be informed about the goals of the project and have to agree to certain future uses of the text provided. And we worked a lot on all sorts of applications. So we tried out Audacity, something called Clone Replayer, which ended up being very useful. We worked with text editors. We tried Ellen and so on. So uh, with this, we were quite ready, and what followed I call the helicopter method of doing fieldwork, so, or doing recording sessions. Uh, essentially what we did as a team of researchers, we, with a hel not a helicopter, but a minibus, we would be dropped in a special uh, selected village, and then we would try to get as many interested speakers as possible, and in a short amount of time to make as many as recordings as possible. Now, this would be impossible without already in advance contacting local coordinators and involving them, right? So what we would do, we would start a day every morning uh, here, Dr. Professor Namyalo. We would have a team meeting. We will distribute the tasks. We would identify who is recording, which tool are they using, which recorder are they using, what are the power sources, are there enough batteries, are there enough data carriers, do we have enough consent forms? Uh, we will also prepare and distribute topics because for the lexicographic work, we really wanted to have as many topics as possible. So maybe talking about endangerment of Baruli, Banyala, or Ruli, Ruli Lunyara is exciting, 
but after 20 times you want to move on to other topics. So we had small notes saying, well, what about you talk about professional development of your children and which future professions you think might be beneficial? And we had a list of 20 different topics to choose from if people run out of ideas. So we would meet the speakers, and sometimes it will happen in big groups, sometimes individually. We'll present what we do, make them, ask them to sign forms, agree on the, uh, well, all the administration, record, record metadata, and move on to the next stage. Now, every recording day we had out of those three weeks, we would spend afternoons and evening processing what we collected. We will put the consent in forms, digitize them. We will enter the metadata in the table. We will copy all the files. We will charge the equipment. We will create backups, and we will get ready for the next day. So uh, you can imagine that after those three weeks, we were, we were very exhausted. Um, but we had one more thing to come. We wanted to invest effort into building capacity of the local community so that they can actively participate in the project. So we organized two workshops uh, which covered the basics of computer literacy, but also basics of transcription. We had an orthography workshop uh, where you see uh, Dr. Anatol discussing with the community members what's the best way to write a specific uh, grammatical markup. Let me get some water. I'm skipping a few technical details, um, but I'll be happy to talk about them in later. So, uh, and just move on to show which kind of outputs we had and what I believe we can do even better. So we ended up with the dictionary and a grammar sketch which is available outside and which we printed and distributed to the community members. We um, have it published as open access, so essentially you can download the dictionary and the grammar sketch uh, from the publisher's website and print it yourself or use a digital version. We, by now, wrote over 15 academic papers on the language material, on topics ranging from morphosyntax to phonetics to conversation analysis, back channel, turn taking, complementation, phasal polarity, modal verbs, subjunctive coming next, and so on. We within this project, supervised several BA and MA theses and the two PhD theses by Amos and Anatol. Uh, we also have adopted a few students from other universities which could not do fieldwork elsewhere and kind of joined our project. So we adopted them, uh, welcomed them to use all of the material to contribute, and we are happy about what came out. We released part of the corpus with this platform I introduced earlier, Dorico, and we are happy to see that the corpus is being used. So in 2022, there was a paper called Final Lengthening and Vowel Lengths in 25 Languages. Our corpus participated, we didn't, uh, but uh, we are happy to see that uh, the corpus has got the life of its own. It's being used for academic research uh, globally. Right. <clears throat> so if you'd like to use our corpus, please contact us. We are very happy to share and to give you an overview. Now, um, I believe this was a story of success under the conditions with the financial restrictions we have. Uh, so I took this experience and I would like to use the next three minutes to very quickly present what I think I can do even better in the next project. So currently I'm involved in the um, project on Khoi Khoi, back to South Africa, actually back to Namibia, um, dedicated to the documentation of dialects of this language. So um, it's a very different setting. We have or the language has a lot of written sources online, which does not exist for Lurul Lunyara. So what we do, we use regular web scraping techniques to harvest articles online and to add them to the corpus of the written language. We digitize and work on the OCR system for Khoi Khoi, all the published material. There is a university program, BA and MA, for Khoi Khoi, and we do our best to involve interested students from this program. So we have a had a transcriber's workshop, an orthography workshop, a grammar analysis workshop with the students. We started using new tools which did not exist or were not very popular in the previous project. What we do the same way, we still use the helicopter method. So in August, my colleague, um, the lecturer at the University of Namibia, had only five days 
from teaching. So he said, okay, take it or leave it. These are the five days. Let's see how much we can get. And we ended up dropping in several different locations, recording over 20 sessions of um, various dialects of Khoi Khoi. And after five days, we left and have plenty of material to keep us busy for the next year. Um, we also do similarly, we prioritize conversational data. So we have one sub-project where we collected um, about 10 conversations. And if you look at the pictures, you see that, as I said, language is not just words. People gesture, people look at each other, people use posture in a specific way, and so on. So these are the data we are very curious about to use in the future research. We do actively search for collaborations. So if you are interested to work on a language of, um, on a Khoi Khoi language, Khoi Khoi, we will be welcome to let you use the resources we have, share our expertise, uh, push your project, um, let you annotate the data the way you want, and so on. Right. So as conclusions, coming to the end, I actually have a wish list more than conclusions. Um, I would like us, me, Professor Namyala, the colleagues from the project, Amos Anatol, to uh, be able to share our experience from the Lurulun Yara documentation project and to see more languages of East Africa being documented and developed in a similar way. Uh, we would like to do it better, and I am pretty sure a lot of you have your own experiences, and I would like you to share it with us for us to do it better work next time. And I would like our data to be used by the community members, not only the dictionary, the corpus as well, by students and by other researchers. And if we can make you do it or help you do it, please contact us. We'll be very grateful for your input. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Alena. That was a wonderful and very inspiring presentation. So I'm sure that there are questions, remarks. Aman. Yeah, he's a teacher. He has a voice. Thank you, Alena, for first showing, uh, showing to us your outputs. A colleague of mine who was a PI was nodding her head. She thought she was sharp, but now, can you see? We'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first observation is with the Ngu, Ngu, a Khoisan language, which, for your information, is the one which got me into Hadza and Sandawe by the influence of Chris Collins, an American Fulbright scholar. I think he documented this. If it's this language or the other one. No, no, no. no, no. Yes, I was wondering if you share the materials and compare the results. Because I understand he has a grammar book with text. Uh -huh. You are talking of uh, the same, more or less the same material. I wish the teams would combine efforts. Yes. And make you make more. That is one. Two, on your Ruri, Bunyara uh -huh. corporate business. Mm, I understand that in African universities, mm, corporate linguistics or documentation is, is either a course or it's missing, in, at least in East African mm -hmm. uh, uh, universities. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's well, well better in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. But how much training is someone required so as to uh, attract the attention of the funders? Because colleagues of mine was, were told several times, and I was also told that you don't have training on documentation, so we can't, it's like, we are afraid to fund you because you don't have training on documentation. Mm -hmm. And the last one with the new again, we are 2020 20 plus. And I'm relating with the experience that Frank Marlow had commented on the impact of the gift of the researcher or researchers who are plentiful now. If you have two or three foreign researchers or nationals doing research in a speaker community, you give gifts to, research, uh, to the speaker community. Mm -hmm. How is that impacting the traditional way of life? Right. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful questions. I hope to uh, be able to remember all of them and address them by one by one. So. Um, uh, the colleague correctly mentioned that uh, um, other colleagues globally worked on Moo, and this is what I kind of meant that um, there was a bit of an unhealthy competition, at least in the past. There were more researchers working on the language than the speakers, which is shocking, but um, not unheard of for a uh, heavily endangered language. Um, Chris Collins, uh, indeed, with Levi Namaseb, produced a grammar sketch, and we ended up using it, but this was developed as we had our documentation projects. So we kind of were running parallel tracks, working obviously with the same speakers, not talking to each other, uh, and uh, we are doing it much better. So for the lexicographic effort, uh, we have a mailing list, Chris Collins is there, I am there, we contribute, we talk, we share. Right. So uh, we learn from this, I believe, and I hope that in the future we will be doing much better. Now, um, related to Mu was the question of the compensation of the speakers, the gifts, and how it affects the traditional way of life. Um, the situation is a bit different in Mu community than in Hadza. Uh, the speakers of Mu have been living on farms, uh, not their traditional life, way of life for the past 100 years. So essentially, these are by now sedentary speakers who rely on the pension by the state. And uh, the gifts or compensations we provided, we had a monetary agreement per day of session, and obviously all sorts of gifts in addition of it. So they were using it to buy the, tea, the new wheels for the car. So um, having a car is already not very traditional way of life, probably, and um, we provided resources for whichever they seemed needed at this specific moment to pay medical bills, to uh, pay uh, fees for the school of the grandchildren because the parents, the children of our speakers, um, passed away. So um, uh, for a language which hasn't been spoken in its um, like original environment, there wasn't much we could have harmed, I would say, with uh, this kind of remuneration. But there are other, co uh, the other fieldwork settings where one should be much more cautious. Okay, now uh, I move on to the question about Luruli Lunyara and Corpus. Um, and one question was uh, related to the, uh, whether there are any classes on Corpus linguistics here, I understand, uh, uh, right? Or like how much is promoted at the local university. I actually, we have, uh, uh, activists here. We have uh, Diego Cavalier, he's a corpus linguist, he's in this audience, he's at the department. I don't know. Uh, are there classes? Uh, is there desire for these classes? Is there space in the curriculum? I cannot say. I believe it should be there. Uh, no matter what you do, whether you work on African languages, English, um, one uses a lot of corpus linguistics methods in teaching foreign languages these days, and this is promoted across the globe. Um, so a lot of curriculum introduce um, corpus linguistics methods as the foundational kind of education for future linguists. And I'm pretty sure I forgot one question. Um, what did you know? <laughs> oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, uh, thank you. I hope I could uh, respond and react to your uh, comments. Yes, Armani seems happy. Sorry, can I go ahead first? Oh, you have the microphone. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, so I'm actually here um, on um, a similar project, actually, documenting Livanuma, uh, which is a language of um, Western Uganda. So it's an interdisciplinary project. My colleague has a background. He's a local speaker, and he has a background in history and archaeology. Well, I'm a, a documentary linguist. So uh, we kind of did, I hadn't realized, but you gave a definition to what we did, which was the helicopter method. We basically documented uh, oral histories, oral family histories, in only three days. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the helicopter method, that, what you call the helicopter method, and also the role of the coordinators and the, um, or like how I would call them the intermediaries which coordinate between mm -hmm. the research team and the local speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I'm very happy to hear there are other projects going on now and uh, let's meet over a coffee and I'll, um, and um, uh, my colleague Professor Namiala will be happy to share her experience as well. Uh, but essentially, um, um, in uh, having local researchers on the spot here at Makareri means uh, uh, they have contacts I, as a foreigner, obviously will never be able to have. So uh, Professor Namiala has been trying to 
approached the community for quite a while and established connections to the um, individual committees, like language development or cultural committees with the communities, and uh, um, many uh, uh, figured out who can be the best, most reliable person within the community who we can approach. So essentially, this person was employed for part of the time of the project, and um, we outsourced a lot of um, uh, mobilization effort to this person, relying on his expertise as a native speaker, uh, uh, relying on his ability to co coordinate the uh, speakers. And essentially, in all of those small field trips, um, we would show up in a place and the coordinator will be there with interested participants, sometimes up to 35, who are willing to be recorded, and then the, it's up to us how we manage the rest of the day and not, I don't know, drop that out of exa from exhaustion in the end. I will be very happy to share also the tools we use like for um, community members with different levels of literacy to show what can be done uh, with the smartphone, with the apps available on the smartphone. Um, please talk to me, I'm um, happy to share. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Professor Alena. I have one question. Uh, can you use um, the corpus for further studies? Uh, for example, if this time you are looking at, um, if you are looking at certain linguistic aspects in Ruri, but this time you want to take up a different project, maybe you are looking at how Ruri uses a singular morphem or a plural morphem, can you again refer to the same corpus or you have to go again to the field yeah. and collect more data? Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So there are two ways to answer this question or like two ways to look at the question. I believe for a lot of phenomena we have um, plenty of data. So um, I skipped the slides but I have an example uh, um, which I used in the workshop. We wrote a paper about phasal polarity, about the persistive marker and how it's used in the language. So with the corpus we have uh, at hand, we had, I think, like half a thousand, 500 examples of what we need. And 500 examples is a lot to be able to say about a specific phenomena. We know what are the most frequent meanings. We know which other prefixes and suffixes this prefix combines with. So essentially, we did most of the work with the corpus, and only for a minor amount of open questions, we went back to the speakers, wrote emails, wrote WhatsApp messages, and asked, okay, can you do it this way? What about this? Does it mean what I think? And so on. So we did um, combine it with a tiny bit of elicitation, but uh, a lot of the data came from the corpus. Currently, we are working, for instance, on subjunctive and the uses of subjunctive. Our corpus has got maybe 5,000 examples of subjunctives. It's already too much. We take 1,000 examples and try to figure out what are the most common usages. So uh, for a lot of um, frequent and less frequent phenomena, what we have is plenty. And only for less frequent phenomena, complicated syntactic judgments, you might have to go back, or you will have to go to back to the speakers and figure out what's happening there. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk and about uh, the field of corpus linguistics and the corpus compilation. Yes, uh, I have two concerns. One is about the access. I was, of course, happy when you uh, came in and, and I thought, you. yes, you are bringing a new modern methods of uh, corpus compilation and, of course, corpus access. <clears throat> so I was wondering uh, briefly how, how would you say the, the, the um, uh, what's the difference between the, that you brought about in the compilation and, of course, access? Because you have mentioned about uh, the, the, the corpora that, is, that are available, or the Luganda one, the Lusoga one, mm -hmm. which are raw. And I was hoping that with the new modern methods, we are going to have access so that you don't need to, to first write to someone, to the owner of the corpus to have it, uh, uh, I mean, accessed. So, um, but when you are presenting, you, you, of course, you, you told us the same, almost the same thing. I mean, if you need the corpus to use our corpus, then contact us. And I don't know what is involved in the contact oh, us. Okay. Okay. Yes, I, I see. Right. Secondly, Thank maybe uh, the second one is related to Professor Lucekelos, uh, whether the, uh, I mean, the efforts that are in place uh, to um, popularize corpus linguistics locally here. And I was also wondering, whether, I mean, from, the, uh, from what you, you did, 
what have you done to see that this, of course the courses, we have written courses when you are revising curriculum, the curriculum, but as you heard yesterday from uh, Dr. Nabidye's presentation, there's a lot of challenges when we are writing a, a curricula because it takes a lot of time because we, we, we are not, we, we are doing other things, mm -hmm. but also um, approving the curricula, it, it takes a lot of time. So yes, we have proposed, but these curricula are still taking their, their time to be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Uh, appreciate the questions. Uh, yeah, so let me cl clarify what I meant with contact us. Um, I tried to emphasize twice we released openly, freely accessible parts of the corpus. And these are the parts which are transcribed, time aligned with video and audio recording. Uh, they are translated into English. They ha do have um, morpheme by morpheme gloss. And those, uh, you don't need to contact me, just use it inside. And my colleagues, or our colleagues who use this corpora, they don't even let us know when they do it. And we are happy that they do it. Uh, like once it's there, these corpora have their own life. But we do have much more than the release components. And uh, we can be able, as um, being in contact with the speakers community, to provide you with contacts, say, if you work on an aphora, and you have a gap in our corpus, so you really need a few grammaticality judgments, we can... Like, we want you to be able to contact us, put you in touch with the speaker so that you can follow up your interests and has access not only to our corpus linguistic resources, but also to all the network with the speakers we have created. And obviously, our knowledge as experts, you know, is this topic worth following up? Would it make sense or not? I mean, you can go ahead and use the corpus, but maybe it's smarter to run it past us and get a bit of an input. Yeah. So I hope it answers your question, uh, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to hear from you, from um, colleagues here, Naviria, uh, right? Uh, like uh, whether you plan to release at least part of the corpus, the part which is not, um, um, well, under the copyright of different publishers and whatnot. I do understand that there are all sorts of restrictions there, uh, but uh, one can maybe try with a small number, you know, 10,000 words, 20,000 words, 100,000 words, and see how far we get. There was another question about um, like annotation, tagging, and like raw versus not raw corpus. Um, we still work on a, a parser and like segment annotator for um, Ruli, and we have a working model, and it's doing okay. For Koiko, we are much more successful because Koiko has had hardly morphology. So essentially, we do have a Python script which runs and automatically glosses most of it and then we fill the gaps and add new works to the dictionary. So depending on the language structure, a lot of things can be, well, automated, and if you follow on this, I try to push my team members to follow on this, improve on the scripts which do this kind of work automatically. There was another comment about the curriculum. I, I, I also share your concern that often one comes into a program and there are all sorts of other priorities, uh, both uh, personal but also like the program has been designed this way. Um, what uh, I think might be doable um, is to have uh, less formalized settings where we learn a tool, learn a technique, have a reading group, uh, try to um, use a method mentioned recently in the literature. Obviously, this requires not only one person who drives it, but also the willingness of the bigger um, surrounding to participate in such an endeavor. So we try to do it in our project, and our colleagues and now students in Jerusalem, hopefully students here, are interested uh, but that's not guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have only two brief questions oh. that will be answered? Have one, but we will have two. Yes, here. Brief, brief, brief. Brief. And then Dr. Thank Nadine. you very yes. much. I'll be, be very brief. Uh, Freda is my name from the Department of Linguistics. Um, I want uh, your experience about the the web um, web texts that you mm -hmm. you collect from the digital uh, environments uh, because my experience okay i developed runya corpus although it has remained on my laptop yeah. uh, for computational purposes mm -hmm. but when i use the, the web crawler to crawl the texts from the web the runya chiga texts they had issues I can't call that um, quality corpus because uh, the percentage was very, very low, like 20% quality. What is your experience? Thank you. So, yeah, yeah um, so my, I have limited experience. The one I have and will be happy to share, also including the script we use, 
Um, for Koikoi, there is a one, only one newspaper, New Era, published in Namibia, and it's got uh, text not only in Koikoi, it's got text in Herero, it's got text in um, Oshiwamba, in um, English, in Afrikaans, I believe. So essentially what we do is we prepare a list of um, URLs, right, uh, for each individual article. We feed this list of URLs to our crawler um, or scraper. The scraper gets all the articles, passes them sentence by sentence, cleans up whatever is not part of the text, and it works mostly. One challenge is that Koiko uses a lot of special symbols for clicks, so we have to post-process it and clean it up. And a lot of what we do next, uh, because we know there are often English correspondences to these articles, we actually, before we scrape, we try to find the English version, match it with the Koiko version, get both of it, and then do alignments so that we immediately get the transcription and, uh, sorry, the translation. Um, I, I will be happy to uh, put you in touch with the uh, student, IT student, who wrote this uh, scraper, and I think the expertise uh, among the university members grows, right? So there might be more younger people who maybe know how to do it better. And what I found, we actually had several test trials where we used this scraper and saw, okay, which kind of issues emerge, how can we mitigate them? Um, you might have had very different kind of challenges which I cannot even think of uh, thinking about Koiko, so I'll be happy to hear what, uh, wh where you struggled with. Thank you, Frida. The very last one. Okay. Ms. Corpus. Um, Thank you for, for your talk on Corpus. I have been at the Institute of Languages also trying to get people to document their languages and use Corpus. My, uh, uh, I would like to talk about a program called Trint mm -hmm. because my main uh, problem was with the transcriptions because yeah. I had too much uh, recordings yeah. and the, the videos were in number of hours which I couldn't manage. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a program called Trint which was passed uh, around in Ghent University mm -hmm. and you were asked to test if it helps, uh, helps you to transcribe your data yeah. but what happened was many of the African languages were not con con mm -hmm. considered in the test. Mm -hmm. So I wrote to them and asked them to add languages. So if you join me in that, trying to write to them, tell them to include especially the uh, undocumented languages because we are the ones who are using this, uh, who need it the most, yeah, yeah. but they had it for the most developed languages and yeah. I think it's a good tool, but we didn't have access to it. Thank you, Mina. That sounds also like a very good advice. I'll be happy to like, see what kind of quality you got out of these transcriptions. Um, there might be other tools, but uh, when we started the project, essentially we even didn't have agreed on the orthography. So we were both uh, collecting the corpus and then improving on the orthography. And we involved a large number of local uh, transcriber speakers, and I'm actually very happy to see Misaj, uh, one of our uh, speakers, project members, here, one of the transcribers. So thanks to uh, people like Misaj, we actually were able to um, delegate part of the work to native speakers and hopefully contribute also to their passion for the language. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we will leave it at this. It was a wonderful uh, talk and a wonderful discussion. So let's give her a last round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Another round of hand clap for our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, our keynote speaker and the chair of the session for all that you have fed us with.